hacking related panels, one per day back in 1998. And somehow I got the call. I'd been coming to Dragon Con for a couple of years at that point for space and science stuff. And uh, I used to be head of the Nashville chapter of 2600, and I was asked to do some hacker shit. So I came here, and I did three of the four panels and dragged a bunch of other people here who haven't really survived, or maybe they're dead or in jail. I don't know. We've all kind of lost touch with each other. But Hacking 101 and 201 have gone on continuously pretty much since 1998. And now you're here, and you're part of it, and there's no escape. You are doomed. You are part of this cult for the rest of your life. Whether you want to be or not, it's like goddamn 4chan. You can never escape, man. You are stuck. You are one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. Woo! All of us. All of us. Hell, Satan. Woo! Stop. Yeah, I took a four-year hiatus so I could go back to school and then a global pandemic happened. What the hell do you expect? What, they haven't done Hacking 201 in four years? Oh, well, Hacking 201 ebbs and flows and things happen and then and appear and then go away. We used to give out hundreds of dollars worth of free booze to everyone and then we got caught and told to stop it. So, did you bring... Yes, you can bring this your own dragon con. If you can't find can booze somewhere, you're not licking hard enough. All right, so enough about me. There are other people up here, too, and I think we're maybe kind of sort of organized enough um, to get started officially. So I'm going to sit down and shut up, and I will arbitrarily uh, decide that we're going to work from my right to my left, and the other people announce themselves, but Scott's got to do some important stuff first. Uh, this is our charity. It's, uh, what is it again? Yes. Cure for children. Okay. Oh, for uh, we're against cancer. We are not for cancer. We are against cancer. This is cancer and ca cancer. Yes. Bad. Yeah, cancer bad. So if you think cancer bad too, this is to get rid of cancer in children. And this is a serious thing. And don't laugh. God damn it. I'm serious. Cancer sucks. I, it does. I've lost friends to it. I hate it. I hate cancer. Kick cancer in the ass. Fuck cancer. Let me hear everybody say it. Fuck okay, cancer. Sir. Fuck cancer. Oh, come on. Like you mean it. God damn it. Fuck cancer. Thank you. We're going to sample that and put it online later. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Rich Katz. Um, I'm an attorney, uh, unfortunately, and um, <laughs> I work in cyber insurance, but my background is technology, data privacy focused, um, and cyber security. So uh, cyber insurance, that's right. Did you say what is cyber insurance? Oh. Well, <laughs> how much time do you have? Um, but no, cyber insurance is an insurance policy that um, typically does a couple of things. One, uh, it will indemnify uh, a company when there's an act error emission in regards to a network security breach and or privacy violation. As time has gone on, it is uh, developed to also include cyber extortion payments. So ransomware payments, right? Like, I'm sure a lot of you guys have dealt with that and or, or heard about it. Fuck that, man. Jesus. Fucking Johnny. Are we talking about being a victim or perpetrating them? Por que no los dos? But anyways, so cyber insurance has a, a pretty broad kind of coverage. Um, I've dealt with thousands of claims in regards to not only ransomware, but email compromises and things like that, um, as well as security researchers reaching out to my policyholders and saying, oh, hey, we found uh, a bunch of information that we may or may not have gotten by, you know, hacking into your systems. Are you okay with us publishing that? If not, you should pay us money, right? So, um, yeah, a long time ago. But anyways, I'm talking too long because I just got an IV and a bunch of drinks. So, whew. Uh Hello, I'm Nick Britannia. I've been coming here for, what, since 2015. Uh, I'm not really a hacker anymore, per se, but I once was. And that's what I'm here for because I'm going to basically be going over uh, the Apple Series computers just for the hell of it. So you guys can see what it used to be like back in the old days. And uh, that's pretty much it. Hey everyone, I'm Jesse Roberts. I'm a cyber threat intelligence analyst at Mandiant. Uh, before that, I was an offensive cyber officer with the Air Force. And 
Yeah, my, my interests uh, besides CTI are also uh, open source intelligence investigations um, and tracking information operations networks, like think propaganda type stuff. Uh, so yeah, excited to be here with you tonight. You all know me and I talk too much anyway. Next. <laughs> So I'm Todd Grady. Been uh, been coming to DragonCon since 2006, but this is my first time on this panel. Uh, been in IT since 1994, so longer than some of you have been alive. Um, kind of done a little bit of everything. I've been dedicated to cybersecurity for the past about 10 years, and I'm a information security threat analyst for a big insurance company that may have like a shield and a cross. <laughs> Hey, I'm Bill Buddington. I'm a senior staff technologist, which is the most generic technologist, most generic job title I've ever heard. Um, and um, the lawyers at EFF say that um, I uh, uh, neither can confirm nor deny that I've hacked anything. <laughs> okay. We're going to be doing some presentations here. So let's just cut right to it because you guys are here to see stuff, right? Hell yeah. yeah? Okay. All right, so we are going to start. Uh, who was in Hacking 101 yesterday? All right, uh, we're going to do the continuation of what he was doing yesterday uh, in Hacking 101. So go right ahead. Bedger, 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 bedger. He made you out of clay? With only no stinking badgers. <laughs> did the TV go to sleep on that left side? Is that one up as well? Yes. Sweet. Alright everyone, so quick recap for those of you who weren't in uh, 101. Basically what we were looking at is a piece of malware that I ran across recently. Uh, and this piece of malware uh, is obfuscated PowerShell and it appears to be loading something that it contains within itself. And what we're gonna do is figure out uh, what that is. And uh, it'll, it'll be basically be an example of like my usual workflow as a CTI analyst. And I'll show you what kinds of things I would want to extract from this malware. Uh, question? Uh, this particular example is in PowerShell only. Uh, however, <laughs> don't worry if you can't read it because I can't really either. It's obfuscated. It's, it's meant to be really tough to read. Uh, but we'll, we'll be moving past the PowerShell part uh, pretty quick today. So um, you, you can spend time going through this step by step if you'd like. Uh, <laughs> but I'll save us a bit of time because we mentioned some of this at 101. And essentially all this is doing once it's deobfuscated and it's actually readable uh, is it's loading this large uh, byte array that starts with uh, 4D, 5A, and then continues. Uh, this editor is called Sublime Text. So it one of the features I like about Sublime Text is it shows you on the right side uh, kind of a preview of the rest of the file. So you can see that, t that hex blob continues for a long ways. So uh, I don't have a lot of hex codes memorized, but one that really excites me when I see it is 4D, 5A. That translates to MZ. Uh, when you convert it to a normal character. And it, MZ is the beginning of an executable program. So to me, wh when I run across that in, in a piece of malware, in, in this case, uh, fortunately, they didn't even obfuscate the hex itself. So I see that 4D5A, and I go, sweet, there's there's our next piece. Is a Windows there. executable, right? What's that? Windows? Oh, uh, it'll be a Windows yeah. one, yeah. So if it was compiled for, uh, for Linux, it'd be a, a different header, most likely. Uh, so mm -hmm. What we did yesterday, uh, so I'll skip that part because when it zoomed in this far, it actually takes a while to scroll through all this hex. Uh, but we copied this entire blob and we pasted it into CyberChef. Uh, CyberChef is a tool made by GCHQ. GCHQ. <laughs> yeah, so so <laughs> right. I imagine probably not a lot of people in this room uh, trust GCHQ. And, well, fair enough. It's basically Britain's NSA. So they released this tool on the Internet, and you can go to GCHQ's actual website and use it. 
Or you can do what I recommend, which is to download the offline version and use it in an offline VM, which is which is where I'm analyzing this malware anyways. This particular virtual machine is Flare VM. That's one that uh, Mandiant puts out for free, but you can, you can make your own uh, virtual machine to analyze malware, put your own tools on it if you want. Uh, but the key when we're looking at malware is to, to keep it in an offline VM so the malware can't call out to the real internet and alert the bad guys that we're analyzing it. Uh, and it also is not running on my actual work computer because I would get an angry email. So <laughs> we're <laughs> so so what I did, uh, you can see the 4D5A up here. Uh, I cut and paste that whole hex blob out of the PowerShell dropper uh, into here. And then the way CyberChef works is you select operations on the left side. You combine them in order to make a recipe. In this case, I just dragged the from hex recipe over there because that's the only operation we need to do to this data. Uh, sometimes we'll see multiple layers of encoding, like maybe this could be base64 encoded as well, and we'd have to uh, you know, drag a from base64 over here, uh, and it would apply that operation. Obviously, that's gonna come up with something, yeah, it's not gonna be happy about that, because this isn't really base64 encoded, but uh, just as an example of how you can combine multiple steps within, power, uh, within CyberChef. So, you can see down here in the output we have MZ, that's, that's what our 4D5A translates to. And actually, all the rest of these uh, hex bytes translate to other stuff as well. This is not terribly human readable because this is a compiled program, so it's ready to run, uh, as opposed to a, uh, when a programmer first makes their program, it'll be written in source code, <laughs> and the compiler will uh, compile it and make it more uh, readable to the processor because processors don't speak programming language in, in most cases. Yes? So, yep, so, so what we have here is likely a piece of functional software. I can tell you that uh, because I've cheated and I've already looked at this malware. Uh, however, if we were at this stage in an investigation where all we have is the PowerShell script, and we've extracted this hex blob, and we see this MZ header, we have a pretty good guess this is probably an executable file, but we don't know for sure yet, and we don't really know what it is in, until we dig into it a bit further. So in order to save this output, uh, I'm going to click this uh, save output to file. Um, you can also access CyberChef on GitHub.io as well, which is nice. I, I that's how I do it. Okay. Yes, if you yeah. trust uh, GitHub.io or GitHub in general more than GCHQ. Yep, it, there's there's a pretty good chance GCHQ is logging everything people use their software for. Uh, <laughs> just, just, as, just as a guess, I mean, <laughs> it's text data that goes in there that's pretty cheap to store, yeah. and there's probably some juicy stuff they could get out of that. So, um, yeah, you could just. Actually, yeah, you could probably scar some GCHQ analysts by just submitting things there, and maybe some of them have to look at it eventually. Uh, Strike up a conversation. Tell them you're lonely and you just want to talk. Yeah, and maybe they'll reach out to you if, if that's something you want. Um, so I already saved this file, so I'll, I'll be skipping that step, but that, that is what you would do. Um, why is that so tiny? That's not the window I had open. All right. I wish I so could see this. Actually see yeah. It. <laughs> so in, in yesterday's panel, that was far enough back. So I keep like leaning to make sure this is still readable. But uh, yeah, we're we're not. Uh, I'll, hacking, I'll try to hacking two hundred one note for future reference. Have a panelist facing monitor so we can actually see what we're talking about. In the <laughs> or put a mirror over there. No oh, mirror. <laughs> so you might. Some of the more astute audience members may notice I have a lot of other pieces of malware in this folder. We'll be looking at those uh, later in a graph. Um, uh, okay, is that? Let's see. Oh, the other way. Yeah, that's uh, that made it worse. All right, we don't need to see all these other ones yet. I'll show you in a more readable version on a graph. Um, all right, so, the, so one of the first utilities that I like to run when I have an unknown executable and I'm not sure what it is yet is Detected Easy. Uh, Detected Easy will do basically an initial triage of the malware and tell me uh, what it is. A whole lot of different uh, pieces of information about the binary. Uh, in this case, it'll tell me what it was uh, compiled with, and I see uh, vb.net. So when I, when I ran across this, I got uh, pretty excited because there's a tool that I really like that I want to show you today uh, that will allow us to decompile this compiled binary all the way back to the original source code. 
uh, and that's due to how .NET works. Most of the time, uh, if you have malware that's written in other programming languages, the best you can get is assembly language out of that. And there's probably some masochists in here who enjoy reading assembly language, but that's not me. So I try to avoid that where possible. Uh, there are tools for that, but uh, it takes long enough. Typically, when I'm in triage mode, I'm not going to dive all the way down that rabbit hole. So luckily, we get to read the source code of this malware today. Uh, so this, the tool that I want to show you is called uh, DNSpy. Uh, I've got it open here. When you first open it, it opens all this other stuff on the left. We don't need to worry about that. Uh, but we are going to point it to... I swear you're going to say Ida Pro or, uh, or Ghidra. <laughs> yeah, so so he's right. Ida Pro and Ghidra would be what we want to use. Uh, if this wasn't a .NET program and I wasn't able to decompile it uh, all the way back to the source code with DNSpy, then, then uh, Ida Pro and Ghidra would be our best bet. I actually, yeah, I'm curious. Show of hands, who would prefer Ida? We have one for Ida. Anybody, uh, two for Ida. Hey, anybody that would prefer Ghidra? Ghidra gang, let's go. All right. <laughs> Usually I'm outnumbered on that. I prefer Ghidra myself, but uh, in, in my old malware shop, uh, everybody else liked Ida, and they would make fun of me for it. So it's just a personal preference thing. They, they do similar things. Uh, they, they fill the same role. But All right, so all we need to do is point DNSpy to our... Uh, unknown piece of malware obviously I, I named it Mustafa rat so I gave a little hint as to what it might be but uh, we'll see in a minute so once you open that up this uh, file that appears at the bottom will be the new file that you open so you can see right off the bat this first uh, <laughs> the name of the program is async client 2 so uh, off the bat does anybody have any guesses what that might be uh, people who are In, 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 in it's it's close uh, so so this so this is a this is a client program um, and and uh, yeah we'll, we'll see what it does when we, when we dig into the code uh, this is actually a hint to the name of this malware um, all right so wh when you expand each of these sections within the program you can you can start to see code so we'll we'll just look at the first one uh, looks like they've labeled it client um, and there's the, there's the malware source code, so we can all judge the uh, the author's work <laughs> if they, you know, programmed well or not. Uh, in this case, this looks like the the very first thing that the the program does. Um, it's it's going to create a mutex. It's running anti-analysis, and that's beautiful. <laughs> but we had to add the good ones. You you got to be careful where you shine a UV light around here. Uh, ho hopefully here we're good, but uh, hopefully my, my upper arm is good. <laughs> I hope so. I don't remember anything happening there. Yeah, so it looks like it, in this case the malware author has politely labeled like all of their functions very clearly. So I have seen other samples of this piece of malware in which they threw it through an obfuscator, and each of these function names are totally random through an obfuscator. An obfuscator. So it's uh, something that makes. Uh, function names and strings that you might ordinarily be able to recognize uh, into random things. So um, all the kind of human readable strings, etc., function names uh, are are uh, not easily discernible. And and they like to do that because they know people like us are going to be looking at the oh, okay, guts of their you. malware and trying to figure out what it does. And so <laughs> in this case, they did not run uh, run this rat through the obfuscator. So. Uh, what, what's funny is I found other similar samples from the same actor, and they did obfuscate them. Uh, this one they didn't, so maybe they forgot. Maybe they got lazy. Maybe they just wanted to make my job easier. Either way, I'm not complaining. Uh, I like taking advantage of actors messing up. So um, we could we could scroll through each of these uh, pieces of code, but we'd be here for a little too long. So I'm going to skip to the the juicier one here, which is settings. So one of the things that I like to look for as a yeah so i know this is a little tiny on the left side um i'm gonna is the is the right side of the screen here visible from the back yeah, yeah? okay so no. this side is the important side uh the left side i'm i'm gonna read more or less out loud if there's parts that you need to see so I, I clicked on a section named settings and to me that's an attractive part of this uh to click on because uh as a cti analyst what i want is uh what is the malware going to try to connect to uh, what is it set up to do? Uh, I, I want to answer questions like that. I don't really care about every detail of how this works, uh, but answers that you know customers are going to want is stuff like, 
what IP address is this going to reach out to so then they can check their logs and see if the rat actually made a successful connection. Uh, so in this case, we're going to see, uh, man, the two finger scroll doesn't want to work in my VM. That's unfortunate. All right, so we have this function looks like it's it's going to be decrypting uh, a bunch of different strings. So we have settings.ports, settings.host, settings.virgin, install, MTX, which uh, I believe is their abbreviation for mutex, but we can check on that once we decrypt this. So uh, one thing you can do in DNSpy is if there is a variable, uh, you can just click on the variable and it will take you to uh, the variable's value. So in this case, the, the variable ports uh, initially before the malware runs at all is set to this obfuscated string. Uh, can it, does anybody recognize what encoding scheme this might be using? Base 64, exactly. So uh, because, so base 64 uses double equal signs for padding. Uh, so if you see a big pile of uh, text with two equal signs at the end, that's typically a base 64 string. Uh, so let's go back to our tool CyberChef and see if we can uh, deobfuscate this string and get it to tell us what port this malware is supposed to connect uh, to the attacker on. So we're going to just select all of that, get it out of the way, and then that's not hex, so we'll drag that recipe away, and then from base64. All right. Uh, can you all see that? Oh. Yeah, all right. It opened a new tab. That's not what I wanted. Okay. So this is a weird issue with CyberChef that I've noticed. So I want you all to see this so you don't... This actually threw off like a whole afternoon for me. Uh, I have pasted something new in here, but until you manually type something, it actually won't recompute the output in some cases. So you saw that MZ header was still down there. That was the last thing I had pasted in. That wasn't what I had just pasted in. So just be aware of that when you're using CyberChef. So does that look like a port number to anybody? Yeah, so that kind of sucks. We don't... That's not useful to us. So we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what this malware is doing with this. Um, if we go back to the settings section. Quick question. Yeah. If you were in CyberShop, this would specify you want to decrypt in this case. Do you need the double equals in there? Like if you left that part out, would it still decrypt it? The padding should be included. Um, yeah, it, it won't it, it won't compute correctly. So base sixty four is going to decode in chunks, and the reason they include those uh, equal signs is if your if your plain text is less than the chunk size that it wants to encode, it adds some equal size to make it the right length. Pop, pop quiz: What command? What exact command would you use in Linux to do this? Dash D as a decoding. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Sweet. All right, so looking at the program, we have a hint actually as to why that string was still garbled even after we deobfuscated it. This is, it says wh what it's doing when it first runs is it sets these settings.ports variable to equal settings.as256 decrypt settings.ports. So it's going to take, uh, it's going to take that garbled string that we got out of CyberChef and it's going to decrypt it based on a key. So we got two ways we could go about this at this point. This AES key has to be somewhere in the malware. Otherwise, how does it know how to decrypt itself? It has to have that key somewhere. However, and we know CyberChef, uh, there is a module in CyberChef for AES-256 decrypt. Uh, but you have to find the key, you have to find the IV, you have to select the right cipher length. And basically, there's a lot of settings you have to do to do that right. And to me, that sounds like work. I, I'm lazy. I like to find the easiest way to do something because I have like five other pieces of malware to be looking at an hour ago. So I want to get done with this one. So what I'm going to do is uh, I, I actually don't care what the AES key is on this. Uh, <laughs> we're just going to make the malware decrypt itself. So malware can be obfuscated, but it must run. We, we said that yesterday. Um, so what's nice about DNSpy is not, not only do we get to see the source code here, uh, but DNSpy is also a debugger. So uh, what I'm going to do is just go to the bottom of this whole blob where it's decrypting each setting. Um, and I have a tendency to hit next and skip my breakpoints sometimes. So I'm actually going to add three in a row. Um, if you're not as twitchy as me with your mouse, you can probably get away with just one. Uh, but basically, I'm just going to set... Uh, I, 
I don't care about the X509 certificate right now. So um, I've set a breakpoint here, here, and here. Uh, so basically, once it's done decrypting its settings, the program's going to stop, and it's going to wait for me to tell it it can keep running before it continues to run. And to be clear, we're running this in a VM. Do not debug malware on your bare machine, because when you debug shit, it runs. And then it's <laughs> now you have malware running on your computer. Not a good idea. Um, especially, so I, I've kind of made some assumptions about the control flow of this malware uh, based on like having looked it up and I can see generally how it's supposed to work. Uh, if I went into this having no idea how this malware works, I might not even know that it's going to hit this breakpoint. So, so yeah, don't don't debug malware on your plain computer hoping it hits your breakpoint because if you put that breakpoint in the wrong spot, it's going to be happily running and you won't have caught it. So, yeah, do it on your parents' computer with permission. Don't do that. That's that's not official advice. All right. Don't do it on my parents. They'll just call me. Yeah. So so. <laughs> Basically, what we're going to do is hit start on this, and it's going to run uh, this piece of malware. There it is. Yep, there we go. Okay. So it says running down here in the bottom left. That's probably too tiny to see in the back. Um, and basically, one, once it hits our breakpoint, there we go. So now it's saying we're right here. So at this point, in the, in the memory for this program is the decrypted value that we want. Um, and, and this is, if you can get your malware to run in a debugger, uh, you don't have to care how stuff in there is obfuscated. You don't have to care how it's encrypted. You just make it decrypt itself and then just read it. Uh, that's that's really the, the easiest way. Like, the mal malware authors want you to spend all this time trying to unravel their their scheme for how it's decoding itself. Who cares? Just, just make it run. Um, so in the... Uh, I have watched one down here already, but if you didn't see that window before, uh, you'd go up to debug and then windows and select watch and open a new watch window that way. We already did that. Uh, I already did that while setting up for this. So uh, down here we have our watch one section and you can type each of these variable names in and it will tell you what currently right now where the malware is paused is the value in that variable. So. Sorry, the mouse scrolled there. So here's, uh, let's see if this will, oh yay, that blows up too, okay. Yeah, DNSpy is being very cooperative and it's letting me actually zoom in. Uh, can you all see these these values? Okay, so we got settings.ports, that's set to 555. We got settings.hosts, it's set to 213, 252, 247, 202. Uh, we could type in settings.version async rat redro edit that's that's the version name for this so so this is a good hint as to what this malware name is if you want to google async rat um, while I'm talking that's fine and you'll see what is uh, what the rat typically does settings dot install and so it's saying false um, settings dot mtx is async rat mutex x redro x so so it will make this mutex on the system when it runs. So this is actually a good indicator for whether or not an infection was successful on a computer. You can see if that mutex was created. Uh, so for me, this, this is the piece of information that I wanted to get out of this malware. Um, it is set to connect to this IP address on this port. So if a customer came to me and said, hey, uh, one of my users like got this malware in an email and they're not telling me if they ran it or not because maybe they're embarrassed, because uh, that happens. Uh, they could check their network logs and they could see it, you know, maybe they see a successful connection to that IP address on that port. You would know that that malware ran successfully and now you need to remediate that box. But if you if you didn't see it, uh, then then you may be able to determine that it didn't execute. At this point for a reverser, it'd be really nice to uh, just Google that IP address and see if it's distributing all their malware. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, you have like a virus total and you can see what, uh, I, you know, other malware might be communicating with that exact same IP address as well and see kind of what family of malware uh, this belongs to. And that that's a great line of thinking for my second presentation, which we'll do later tonight. Uh, we will do that actually on, nice. on, on VT and I can yeah. show you how we, we'll build a graph of as many related samples as I can find on VT. So, so uh, that, and that, that's an excellent, uh, that's an excellent example of a pivot. So if I, I have this one piece of malware, I, I want to 
you know, my job as a CTI analyst is to pull up as many related pieces as I can find. And so, you know, if I can find on, on VirusTotal other samples that are also calling out to the same IP, uh, I can, and they're similar looking samples, now, now I have a new threat actor group, basically, and I, and I can start growing that by adding things to it. I see a question in the back. Can, can you come uh, to the mic if you... We've got a microphone for questions. Somebody threw it. I got to throw a mic right here. We didn't bring it to the box anymore. So without getting too into the weeds, Ari is not my specialty, but I've written some reports on <laughs> malware with a little bit more sophisticated techniques that use breakpoints to spin up IOCs, false variables, uh, any kind of red flags to watch out for. Uh, as far as that goes, it might indicate that kind of behavior. Yeah, so that, so that's a very good point, which is this is a pretty simple piece of malware because, you know, we, we have only a few hours here and, and other presentations to get to. There, there are, uh, for, for every way that I can analyze a piece of malware, there's another way that somebody's tried to make that difficult. Uh, so, so that's that's a very good point. Uh, there are pieces of malware that will detect a debugger. Um, although DNSpy actually can detect that it's trying to detect the debugger and intercept those calls and say, "Just kidding, you're not a debugger. Keep running, buddy." Uh, but it can only do that for three types of calls. There's uh, there's much more clever. Uh, actually, let me see if I can find the part of the program here because uh, async right actually does have some anti-analysis capability in this particular sample if we were to keep um, actually let's go to uh, yeah settings dot anti is where that is set uh, that's set to false so this particular sample isn't going to call the functionality that would do anti-analysis but let's take a peek at what that would look like because that's a that's a very good uh, point Yep, no, that's the uh, startup. Over them. Yeah, okay, this section is called anti analysis. Wonder what that part does. Uh, they, they have very helpfully labeled this. All right, so, so we have three. Uh, there's there's five functions that are oh, built dude. into this. There's detect manufacturer, detect debugger, detect sandboxy, is small disk, and is XP. Uh, and if any of those are true, uh, it fails. So we could read each of these functions, uh, but th that'll give you an idea of at least the five functions built into this rat. Uh, but there are as many ways as there are to find malware, there's always another way that they'll, they'll try to not be analyzed. So uh, given that the anti-analysis appears to be disabled, I guess intentionally, uh, is it possible that this was a like a development build that escaped into the wild? Uh, in in this so that's a good theory. If all we knew was the things that I have said in in this presentation so far, that's, that's a good uh, that's a good like analytic lead. Basically, uh, I've actually spent like a week looking at this whole threat actor, and they definitely used this particular piece in the wild. Um, I don't know why they wouldn't just turn that on because it's free. They could set that false to be true and make my job harder, but <laughs> they didn't. Uh, but these are also the same clowns who forgot to obfuscate this sample, so it's easier to read. <laughs> so threat actors are also humans, and just like me, they make mistakes. Uh, so that, that's a very good point. They they really could have just turned it on and chose not to. Uh, it is it is possible. I have seen development builds in the wild before of other pieces of malware. Uh, so that's definitely something to consider as you discover a piece. Uh, Bring it up to share with everyone. Um, you want my germs? <laughs> you just <laughs> we got alcohol here. Question? So uh, matter, <laughs> I'm sorry, I Somewhere. lost track of. I had a follow-up question, and then I lost track of my train of thought. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you think of it, just ask again. So, okay, so deter determining that they had it in there for, um, what was it called? Anti uh, anti analysis. Anti analysis. Where do you see what it's gonna do? Uh, like what what it will do once it runs successfully. Yes. Uh, so that that would be in uh, the rest of the program here, which I'm not going to delve into. Uh, so we, we could we could spend time reading each part of the code. Uh, yes. However, I will say the easy answer here is as soon as I see async client 
up here, I'm Googling that string. Like, I, I do not care what this code says. I'm putting that into Google and seeing, like, does has anybody else written a malware analysis report about a piece of malware that said async client right at the top? They have. It's it's pretty common. So so that that's kind of the shortcut. I'm always looking for shortcuts if, if I can like save some time. Uh, if if I can't find anything like that, then I would just read the code to see what it's doing. And and luckily they forgot to obfuscate it. And that's uh, how you kind of uh, you know enumerate in general different families of malware um, by looking at reports that other people have written and writing a report yourself and kind of connecting the dots in some way, shape, or form. The the cybersecurity industry is really pretty collaborative and especially in the defensive side it's 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 neat like just how much analysis is out there for free because people want to help their industry partners also succeed yeah i was hoping you you could provide some context on what type of systems this was actually targeting because for me you know i specialize in cloud security cloud security system docker containers um in migration of on-prem infrastructure to the cloud and hardening of those things creation of cloud bastion hosts your type of analysis is very different from what I do, um, the tools that I use. So I was hoping you could provide some context on what this would actually be targeting. Yeah, good question. So this, uh, from from what I've seen, uh, this rat is meant to run on individual workstations, typically Windows workstations. Although, as we can see here, uh, if the computer OS full name contains XP, it will not run. So if you have a Windows XP machine, fortunately you have a piece of uh, machinery that is secure against async rat infections. Congrats. Uh, it's probably insecure for other reasons, though. Like, like the Metasploit module. Sure back too. Yeah. There's there's still an exploit in Metasploit that works every time against Windows XP boxes. <laughs> oh wait, oh wait, zero six seven will work every time you're trying to pop an XP box, but the async rat won't run on it. Um, It's safe from async rat. You may have other issues, though. Is <laughs> There's a host is that, of yeah. other issues. Is there yeah. a 067, the, the uh, a favicon one? It was, a, it was an RCE that right. exploits the, I think it was the SMB service oh, okay, on XP. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know that doesn't really narrow it down that much. This is XP. <laughs> oh, out of range. Who would, who would target Samba? Who yeah. would target Samba? Why would they do rude things like that? Um... <laughs> Yeah, so that's so that's what I had for this piece of malware. Um, but later in the presentation, uh, later in the day, um, after we've had some other talks, we can also uh, go <laughs> and I'll show you how I would hunt for other related samples because um, my my customer may maybe only cares about you know the one sample they sent to me, uh, but as an analyst, I want to build up my understanding of uh, the you know, every piece of malware this group has made so that then I can understand the group better. Uh, I can see what they change between samples. I can get an idea of what, uh, just just throw it at them. I think it would go better. Oh, oh so close. So, so we'll do that. We'll do that in the next part. Any, any last questions on this before we move on to someone else? Got me. It cite me. Hey, Windows XP is secure against async right infections. <laughs> and the tools may vary. I, I'm a, a Android reverser, and I don't really use uh, uh, Ghidra or Ida so much. Um, the tools that I tend to use are uh, Jadix, which reverses a piece of compiled Android code in APK uh, into uh, Java. Uh, and actually, Ida does work for uh, compiled native binaries that are, that are in... Um, <laughs> that it, um, and uh, and, this is, this and is like better than the beach balls at DefCon. <laughs> <laughs> and like for Android, um, the compiled uh, 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 binaries are, uh, are are you know compiled into uh, what's called. Um, uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm I'm, co I'm cogent today. It's Sunday. We're all tired. <laughs> Um, oh, point blank behind wow. the ears. Oh, 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 shit got real. <laughs> so it's compiled into small e code, S M A L I, and uh, you can, you know, uh, take a, a APK and then decompile or uh, de decompile it into do a dot small e file uh, with something called APK tool. So the the tools may vary. But um, the you know based on platform. 
Okay, real quick, just a quick follow-up to that question they had earlier. I'm kind of new to this, and this is why I'm asking the no newbie question. Um, so what kind of anti-analysis things can malware do to itself? So the yeah. So the question is, what what kind of anti-analysis things can malware do uh, to itself? So I've seen malware uh, check for running process names to see if it's uh, like VM tools or other processes commonly associated with virtual machines are running. It'll check the computer name. Uh, this malware checks to see if the disk size is really small. That may indicate a virtual machine. Um, we had somebody yesterday mention like a really clever. Uh, I think uh, they found a malware that checked the fan speed. Uh, to see if it, because VMs don't have fans, that that was neat. I've been, I've never seen that in the wild, but I would, I wouldn't even be mad. I'd just be impressed if I ran into that. Um, oh, okay. So yeah. So in this case, this particular one is a rat, a re remote access Trojan. So it will connect back to that command and control server and wait for uh, commands. Typically, rats will feature, you know, upload and download files, execute files. Um, sometimes they'll steal passwords. Um, uh, remote access Trojan, R-A-T. Ooh, nice shot. That, that made a thunk. You want this? You're being passed around. I'm good. Appreciate it. Oh, cool. Thank you. Oh, usually it just shuts off. That's that's almost every time what it does. Uh, so some malware will delete itself. Uh, but if it, yeah, it, most most of the, most of the samples that I've seen when, yeah, when they when they detect that they're being analyzed, they just turn off immediately because they don't want to give the sandbox environment or the analyst like any further information. It just terminates the process and it's done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, defense in depth. <laughs> would you like to do Johnny? Would you like to do yours? All right. Well, we'll move it over to Johnny for his uh, presentation on citizen science. Oh, oh, oh! Do we have one more question before we move no, on? Who's got a Pixel Three in their pocket? Who is it? Somebody have a phone called Noob One W U N? <laughs> How about uh, the Shaverian S23? I just wanted to thank you all for connecting to my Wi-Fi for an Apple. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you a little bit more on that later. Who's to say I haven't? All right, so next project here. This one isn't going to be as long or as interesting because it's still kind of in development stage. Um, I was gone for a few years. I went back to school. And um, I'm double majoring in computer science and astrophysics. And I got the associate's part done and actually, actually surprisingly graduated with high honors. Um, I guess I'm a late bloomer because I really sucked my first time around in college, <laughs> but um, did very well this time. So I, I've been thinking ahead. I need a project, something that will be fun um, <laughs> for my, my senior year, which will either be at Middle Tennessee State University, maybe, although I hope to be up in the Washington, D.C. area by then. But what the hell, I'm going to get it started. I've got some professors who are helping me write grant uh, proposals. And what I'm doing is, oh, there it is. OK. And page 10, yeah. Yep. Title there, Citizen Science. And you know, says uh, pretty clearly what we're doing is we're tracking meteors and meteorites. Uh, using cheap hardware. If you have a network of uh, these camera systems set up, you can triangulate where the meteors come from, which part of the solar system. I'm keeping them in circulation. Yeah. Well, keep the war going. Keep the war going. Um, we don't have the camera system set up in here, but if we did, we could. Um, what they do is the meteors, which are you know the things that don't make it to the ground, it can track. I have the high ground. <laughs> it can track <laughs> where they come from in the solar system, and from the meteorites, ones that make it to the ground um, with a wide enough um, network of camera systems, you can kind of triangulate and hopefully find whatever it was that made it to the ground. My long-term interest in this, I'm going to continue with my education as long as it's free, um, because free is good, and I hate student loan debt, and I don't have any, and I don't want any. 
is to um, I want to keep us from going the way of the dinosaurs basically protect everybody in the world from giant space rocks that want to murder the fuck out of us you're welcome that's going to be my job and um, hopefully you know maybe not my generation but the next one also be able to profit off those suckers because there's a whole lot of really valuable stuff flying around up there in space and if we can get hold of it oh yeah much mucho money but uh, I don't think I'll be around to profit from it but maybe someone else will we can get um, a lot of the the dirty polluting industries uh, off the earth and move them out into space where they belong anyway that's the long-term thinking we gotta start small because um, I don't have anywhere near the PhD necessary yet to do this kind of uh, big project stuff so what who uh, that is not up to me do do we have any information on that from the people you know like in charge I'm not in charge of anything here anymore no, they're not even listening. Okay. Uh, DragonCon at DragonCon.org might be able to answer. By the way, um, uh, anyone who has any requests, comments, criticisms, uh, you shouldn't do death threats because we're all friends here at DragonCon. Feel free to contact DragonCon at DragonCon.org with any of your DragonCon related questions or suggestions. Or again, if you're feeling lonely, you just want to talk to people because I'm sure upper management who I've annoyed so much over the years um, would be quite happy to answer questions from hundreds, possibly thousands of convention <laughs> attendees asking them random weird shit. So awesome. Tell them that this panel fucking rocks. Woo. Yeah. You can actually, the way you, Oh, Oh, that reminds me to, uh, of our, our super secret coding project for tonight. Um, yeah, the way you can tell them and, uh, that they'll actually pay attention to it, that this panel really fucking rocks is to use the dragon con app and give it a five star rating and throw some comments in there. Again, they can be really weird comments because they expect that from us. Oh, Oh, that'll be really interesting. looking when we see them there. <laughs> <laughs> um, 3D. But yeah, uh, uh, because I'm easily distracted here, we're getting off uh, the, the my presentation here for a second. My, my thought for a super secret coding project I've, I've, is I've had people coming up to me randomly complaining about the Dragon Con app because they somehow think I'm in charge or have anything to do with it whatsoever. <laughs> but I'm glad to listen to the criticisms. And my thought was Dragon Con has had this app how many years now? 20. Ten, really? That? 20. 20 okay. Too well, many. Oh, too many. All right. Well, yeah, They've had it for a long time, and people are complaining about stupid shit. And so I was thinking, well, maybe you know, we as a bunch of drunken hacker types could include something together that's better in one night and throw it on GitHub. Oh well, there we go. With blackjack and hookers, yeah, we could have a blackjack and hookers button there. Throw it up on GitHub, and um, yeah, you know, say, hey, Dragon Con, you know, nan nan nan, we did this better in one night when we were drunk than you have in X many years. Plus, we've got a blackjack and hookers button, but it's free and open source. So if you want to use our code base to actually make your fucking app better, why don't you do it? So, all right. Anyway, back on topic here. Um, I, I'm. So I'm looking around for information about getting into one of these camera networks and doing this meteor meteorite uh, monitoring, but I'm also a broke-ass college student again at the moment, so I want to do it on the cheap. But I want to actually get useful science results. I'm sorry, do you have a question? Oh, that's okay. No, go ahead, talk. No, now, now. Sorry, okay, or I'll forget. I'm, uh, I'm curious, how has, if or, and or has it, uh, AI changed your jobs? Uh, specifically you, since you were talking about, like, uh, uh, analyzing malware and stuff like that. Rewind back to your talk. Go. So, sorry about that. Sorry. No problem. So uh, the question is, how, how has AI uh, changed your job? So, and or has it? Yeah. So for me, I've been experimenting with making with making AI uh, deobfuscate scripts for me because I don't like looking at obfuscated code, and I especially hate the fact that the assholes who make this stuff spend like five seconds obfuscating it and then I have to sit there for hours deobfuscating it. So if I can feed it into an LLM and it will shit out the correct answer, that'd be great. The problem is I've noticed a lot of the time it very confidently tells me about a completely different thing than I put in. So I actually have to deobfuscate it to a degree myself in order to fact check the AI. So does it save me time? Not yet. I think it will. This stuff's getting better all the time. I, I expect within a couple of years I could feed an obfuscated script into BARD or ChatGPT or whatever it's called this week and get, you know, a, a decent response out of it that, that deobfuscates uh, some malware for me. That's what I hope to see. <laughs> it's staying there. Wow. That, I think it's because the back is hollow. <laughs> Um. So I'll add 
to. I'll add the AI question. Yeah, I'll add the AI question in that uh, one of the things that one of the problems we're having with AI is that we've had. <laughs> Who brought these? We want more. More. Give us more. I don't think we're getting our security. Go out and buy more right now. Room. Right now. Go. All right, you can stay. One of the one of the problems we've had with AI is so we pretty much had to block access to all of them because coders think that they can upload our proprietary source code and don't do things do with it. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, other proprietary information, please write me a letter to our client named this, this, this with their account number and their social security number. So we have stood up internal versions, but yeah, we've had to block access to any external LLMs. And the reason for that is that the AI will at some point in the future give your proprietary information to some random citizen on the internet uh, in response to something they ask, and you don't know when that will be exactly, and no. frankly, the people who make the AI, AIs don't know when that will be, because it might just pick your sentence that you put in to, to learn from, basically. It, yeah, data segmentation is a huge problem with AI in general, because it is something that, uh, AI is, to some extent, required to have in order to function, uh, the kind of like clever and and you know um, uh, random ways that we put together <laughs> thoughts as humans make artificial <laughs> beings that are able to think as we do dynamic in the ways that we that we expect artificial intelligence to be and <laughs> and so. Um, I think that like the security threats that are presented by AI have to be competitive on the AI level. You can't just rely on database segmentation in the ways that we have in traditional apps. Um, because if you do, then um, the the dynamic and 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 interesting ways that AI I interacts with data on all levels uh, will will uh, you know get the better of you and I think that um, y what you need to do is to create protections on the AI on, on on the generative level rather than just the data application level so and also too AI makes shit up so th so th there was a, a recent um, incident where yeah, some lawyers here decided to um, Basically, they're like, hey, can you write a reply brief to, um, thank you for making me look cool in front of everyone. Um, but some lawyers literally like, hey, uh, we need a reply, a reply brief on this case with these circumstances, blah, blah, blah. Put it in chat GBT, and it comes out with, you know, something that makes a lot of sense, right? Well, they submit this without any review by any lawyers. Okay, and guess what? Rushing, so you're there's not going to get the prod this time. There's actual quotes and case law in this reply brief with like legally sufficient case sites, but the cases don't fucking exist. Yes. Okay, and the lawyers didn't think, hey, maybe we should double check that these cases actually fucking exist. Instead, they're like, no, we're just going to submit this in. So as you can expect, opposing counsel looking up this case law was like, what the fuck? And the funny right? thing is, and now they're now those attorneys that submitted that are getting disbarred. Yeah. And so in that right. case, in that case too, like they were like they were detention. Is this a real case? Question mark. Enter and it was like yes, it's a real case. Yeah, no, because like like you said though, AI wants to please, right? Which I guess is good for like the twentieth generation sex robots or whatever. But at the same time, Wait, like. What? What? Tell me more. What? <laughs> That's disgusting. Where? <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe to my newsletter and I'll tell you more. Um, but the thing is, is like... His OnlyFans is very popular. Well, <laughs> it's, it's all AI generated, so... Um, but no, I mean... the, the it third nipples? <laughs> it, can, it, it can be as many nipples as you want, actually. 
So, but no, but, so the thing unlocked. is, a, a, any question with AI, all right, and I'm talking from like a legal perspective, you, it, it's not even trust but verify. It's like, you're fucking lying to me, all right? I need to make sure that what you're proposing and what you're saying is actually legitimate. So, you know, my one caution to everyone is AI is really hot right now, and it's like... It's a bubble. It, it, it may be, but, I mean, it, it's the future, right? But at the same time, like, any question about should AI do this, it's like, yeah, let's fucking do it. But at the same time, you should not trust a single word out of chat GPT's mouth. So my follow-up question here boils down to... Uh, is a follow-up on his uh, kind of how do we differentiate between things like generative AI, you know, the content creation versus, you know, AI within the tooling that we use within information security and security as a whole. How has that currently expanded for tools like Drata, who, you know, is a startup that is rapidly expanding, who governance, risk, and compliance automation that is now introducing their own AI tooling. How do we differentiate between that, the tools that are currently available, and then also being able to integrate things from siloed data sets, creating our own data machine learning models that are specific to our unique use cases. How has that impacted your job right now, or has it not really? Um, like you, this, fo this is focusing on differentiating between things like generative AI that is chat GPT, just throwing in a bunch of stuff and then being able to hone AI through the tooling that we use within industry and then being able to create our own custom specific machine learning models for the context for whatever it is that we're trying to do, the thing that we're trying to accomplish. How has that impacted your job right now? I, I think that like, uh, you know, if we're talking about generative AI, generative AI is, is the generator of the hype right now with AI in general. And there are plenty of machine learning models that have been integrated into our society uh, for better or worse, mostly worse, uh, over the last 10 years at least. Uh, I can't recommend enough that we have a panel uh, uh, you know, yesterday about uh, you know, machine learning and uh, and generative AI and uh, chat with GPT. Uh, it, this changes everything? Question mark. And and I I pointed uh, to a book by Kathy O'Neill, Weapons of Math Destruction, and uh, that's a great book about how generative or sorry uh, how uh, how um, you know uh, these. Uh, uh, machine learning models have integrated themselves into sentencing guidelines and uh, predictive policing and uh, job applications and credit and virtual credit scores and all sorts of realms of our lives where we didn't expect and didn't consent to them actually being there. And I think that that's uh, something that we need to pay attention to a lot more vigilantly than we have been because they have failure modes which are very dangerous to the way that we um, expect our society to be run. And not only do they fail uh, in disastrous ways, but they are completely oblique to actual auditing because they are black box models we are being run by um, increasingly run by uh, technologies that we have no insight into nor oversight over yeah i mean and i would just add to like ai is such a broad term now but like i like the term machine learning right versus ai just because it's it's it, to me it makes more sense from a logical perspective but Machine learning AI is dependent upon the information that's fed to it and the information it's using to make its decisions, right? And so if there's errors in that information, then there's going to be errors in the output. And that's why you can't use AI for legal services or accountant services. And you need to double check everything no matter what you're doing. Or so, even like human assumptions that uh, we build into right. these machine learning Because there's natural bias that, because of the data that's entered, right? You know, I, th I think of like police, you know, predictive policing models and the fact that um, if there is inc like a, a large amount of crime in a certain area, then police should be deployed more to that certain area. Well, that might be a logical first assumption, but that means that there is uh, increasing, uh, that, that means that anyone that is doing anything in areas where uh, where there are a large amount of police deployed because of these predictive models, 
um, is going to be arrested uh, for them no matter what. Whereas any small crime in areas where, or any any equally uh, uh, destructive crime in areas where there there isn't a large amount of crime, uh, it is 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 given given a given a free pass. You find mm. what you're looking for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's a and there's a and there's this feedback loop that happens because right. of that. Yeah. Yeah, and like, Absolutely. where is where is a lot of like ChatGPT getting their data from? Right. Well, like well, Twitter and fucking Reddit. Well, again, this is uh, <coughs> there's there's a you know again not to get all political and everything about this about this in general because it's a hot button topic but from what i understand if you go ask chat gbt to give me a you know rundown of what trump has done wrong it gives you a long list of all these little little things that he's done if you go and ask it the same thing about biden it literally says well i can't comment on a private individual <laughs> Dustin, can we have our chickens back? Okay, you gotta get one of them and see if you can shoot that one down. Can, can we have our chickens back, please? Sir, did you have a question? Yeah, with the. Uh... Oh, look at these tall motherfuckers. <laughs> Missed the goal. Pure, pure havoc. <laughs> got that one. With, uh, Black Hat, they, they came out with the, the, the presentation uh, where they talked about uh, huge into the mic. Can you uh, speak into closer the mic. into the mic, please? All right. With Black Hat, they, um, there was a presentation that kind of opened up a lot of people's eyes to the fact that the CubeSats and a lot of other satellites that are in currently in orbit are, have absolutely no protection at all. And anybody with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of money, get, um, about $10,000 can create a ground station and then hack into any of the satellites. Matter of fact, they were. Um, the, he went in quite detail that the more expensive the satellite, the less security it had on it. Some of them. So what's the question? Sorry. Oh, how do you think it's going to affect everybody as we go forward as now that it's out there? And like he said after his presentation, he really wish he hadn't done the presentation <laughs> to alert everybody. But uh, he does a quick Google search for Black Hat. Security by obscurity is, is effective until it isn't. Until someone discovers some of those critical details where it can be exploited. And I... Um, you know, I, I think that like uh, these systems should be, a lot of, you know, especially a lot of SCADA systems in the U.S. are are very heavily defended by security by obscurity because no one knows or no one except for a few people know the details of them, and that has to change. That obscurity is fine, but it shouldn't be relied on in terms of things that can really affect our lives and and uh destroy people's lives yeah and, and so i've had a lot of claims come in on cybersecurity incidents and things like that for municipalities um large uh utility providers things like that and um it's shocking to me how often these very large publicly like important organizations have like open rdp right that they have access where if you just know what port they're operating on in their ip address you can get their command and control systems um, i worked for a company that had a very in-depth security threat intelligence group and they literally they literally got access to a hydroelectric dam Hello. in germany Okay, and they... Hi, Mom. I'm in the middle of my panel right now, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hang on. Dragon Con saying hi. Hi, Barbie. There's a lot of people who said they love you, so you are loved. 
She loves you too. <laughs> she says send money. <laughs> so we're, sorry. We're gonna break at midnight. I'll okay. give you a call. Right, Eleven o'clock right. your time. <laughs> oh, you're going to bed now. Okay, yeah, I'll call you tomorrow then. <laughs> Bye, mom. <laughs> but anyway, long story short, um, you know, we got access to literally <laughs> nice, um, yeah. like the command and control panel for a geo, a, a hydro geoelectric dam, where it was like there was literally like a button that was like turn on, turn off, right? Like it was fucking wild. And I'm like, is this real? And they're like, yeah, we could literally click this, and the entire thing will turn off right now. Yeah, right? I can comment on the satellite stuff a bit. Um, the the CubeSats are a relatively new phenomenon, and um, a lot of are you talking about the microsatellites like the mesh network? CubeSats. Uh, no, the uh, there are a couple different levels of satellite now. There's the CubeSats, which are the uh, pretty much the like amateur and semi-pro type things that are done by a lot of universities and advanced high schools and stuff. And yeah, they're learning the hard way that security is important. You should consider that from the beginning when you're designing your project. Um, the plus side on that is they're relatively inexpensive and they tend to fall out of orbit um, after a few weeks to a few months at the most. So any problems about them being hacked are going to be self-correcting in a relatively short time. The um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, the, uh, uh, oh, there was a f hilarious phrase I learned yesterday. I, I'll say it r randomly if I remember it again. Um, the more expensive stuff, which can be you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and planned out years in advance, um, they do have a limited life a lifespan that depends on their maneuvering fuel, and once they're out, um, uh, there's not a whole lot what you can do with them after they kind of drift out of optimal orbit and a lot of times they'll be de decommissioned uh, before they run out of maneuvering fuel by putting them into a unrecoverable tumble so again that's kind of a self-correcting problem and it's been known for a few years as uh, well uh, about 15 years at this point as the technology advances that security implications that were never considered when these things were originally designed are going to crop up but again it's a problem that eventually self-corrects as the satellites become obsolete and are either put into a tumble or, in some cases, deorbited. Um, the uh, the relatively newer class, which would be like the Starlink stuff, um, they they do have, on average, a lot higher level of security than some of the older satellites because they're very new. But they also aren't going to stay up in orbit uh, for more than a few years at a time per satellite, and they're designed to deorbit and burn up after a couple of years. And uh, the generations on those types of uh, satellites are advancing rapidly, and the security tends to stay a lot more current than with the satellites that are supposed to be up there for decades at a time. And they're uh, middle or low Earth orbit, um, and uh, as a result of that, they have low latency. Um, I, I had uh, as my home internet uh, uh, HughesNet for a while. Um, how many of you know HughesNet? Oh yeah. God, yeah. Fuck you. Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're all adults here. You can swear. It's like when people like censor fuck on the internet. It's like, bro, it's the internet. You can swear on it. I just, just to finish up my thought, which is like uh, that um, you need a, a larger constellation of satellites for things like Starlink because they are lower orbit and they will not be geosynchronous and they phase out of your line of sight quicker. And for things like Star, uh, for for things like a uh, huge huge net and um, and um, there's another one that's a huge net equivalent. Yeah, if you're a ground-based visual astronomer, bias out, bias out or something. Yeah. If you're a ground-based visual astronomer of any sort, um, Starlink is yet another reason to say "fuck you, Elon." So there mm. you go. <laughs> but I, I have had uh, living in a rural area. I have had a uh, large amount of success with with with, with Starlink, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, just, hope, just hope your Ethernet port doesn't get fried by lightning because it takes them about four months to ship you the router. I know that for a fact. Yeah. The, the constellation um, has gotten better over time. That's one thing to, to note about Starlink. Um, and I 
am annoyed by Elon Musk is present on this earth uh, as much as anyone else. But it has been kind of a saving grace in a rural area of California where I live. Okay, so okay. Um, something funny from the space track and people who have actually worked at SpaceX, they say that Elon Musk buying Twitter was the best thing, one of the best things that could have happened for SpaceX because now they can actually focus on reliability and safety and <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to just getting stuff out the door. And they've got kind of a betting pool going on that if they just change the locks on the doors, how long will it take Elon to notice? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got a few free giveaways. Free giveaways. Free stuff. Free giveaway. Woohoo! Uh, we've got. We're going to do uh, policy trivia. Uh, Chuck, you're not eligible here because you've you've done this before. <laughs> and I guess we're uh, we're going to uh, start the eligibility line here and not in that direction because some of you know the answers here too. But uh, so for our prizes, we've got these, uh, we've got uh, EFF t-shirts. Uh, one is a large and one is a 2X. And, and if, you win, if, you, if you answer the question, you can choose what you want. And we've got three of these. These are the privacy badgers. These are from uh, DEF CON, uh, Badge Life at DEF CON. And this is a privacy badger and it's got a shitty add-on. Which is CertBot. <laughs> so, uh, and what's on the back is almost uh, more cool than what's on the front. A lot of great artwork on the back. At DEF CON, we weren't from, even aware. Yeah, this is from Herald and Verbal, in case you know them. They, so These are cool. So, uh, we're going to go through the trivia questions. And uh, uh, if you know it, uh, just uh, <laughs> jump up and, and shout. So, huh? Well, that's my point. It, it, it is not. It is. Uh, it is uh, not out of bounds to use Google or Chat GPT. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> first come, first served. Who said C first? Who bite, said who bite, said C? Bite, bite. <laughs> This is turning in. This is turning into a clusterfuck. Yes, that is the goal. Let's see them fight over it. Rubber Wait, chicken duel at five pieces. Who wants to see people fight for the match. prizes? Are you not entertained? <laughs> what are those things called? Because I gotta get whole boxes of those for the next panels I'm gonna be on. All right, so you were the first one to make the C with your hand, so I'll what? take that. Yeah. What, uh, what? Which prize would you like? Uh, extra. Okay. We've got two X and large. Two X. Staff. Okay. <laughs> Let's go back down. So the bill in question, in, in 2018, the Georgia legislature introduced uh, SB 315, and some people are saying that this bill was written to put one specific security researcher in jail, and this has to do with the election systems and has something to do, a little bit to do with the voting machine. So... What was the name of this security researcher? Actually, there's two. There's two names we, that we will accept. It's rubber. It's rubber. No, no. it's not charged. It's not going to show. Who said Chris Grayson? I'll take that. Okay, it was Logan Lamb and Chris Grayson. So, all right. What, what, what's your choice? Okay. Gotcha. Huh? Huh? 
You can yeah, have right. one or the other. Which yeah. one? Okay. DEF CON badges are so much cooler than yeah. Dragon Con badges. That is the correct choice. <laughs> okay. Next question. I don't have my laptop. Uh, which state le uh, Brad we'll is not we'll, a state we'll put it on the screen Which state legislature in le legislator introduced the bill? Hey. I'll give you a hint. He is our current <laughs> He's our current commissioner of labor. Five bushels of apples an hour. The Georgia Department of Labor is next door, literally. And and who is who is uh who is elected head? Google, Google, Google. It's that guy. Oh, she did. She won it. Okay, T-shirt or this badge? This is a rubber chicker so chicken song. He did it. I did not do this monstrosity. <laughs> this, this is the this. rubber chicken song. Okay, question two. Question two. This is the rubber chicken song. Okay. Question two. What part of the Communications Decency Act does SESTA FOSTA modify? B. Who said B? Q you said B first. L O slash D slash right. sixty four K colon. Okay, so let's see. Shirt or badge? Badge. Okay. The last one. Okay. Okay, let's see who wants a shirt. Shirt for his girlfriend. The last one is the large shirt. <laughs> Dude, that was some matrix shit right there, bro. That was fantastic. Okay, this is uh this is kind of a long answer. Um so uh, instead of shouting this one out, I, I, I'm going to look for a raised hand. Okay, go for it first. Uh, <laughs> no, this is not a letter. This is a, this is an essay question. What was the stated intent of SESTA Foster, and what were the actual consequences? Tell me the stated. E e either one of those is fine. The rubber chicken song. Okay, who was who was next? Okay, go ahead. John. Excellent, excellent. Right. Yeah, that's important. Also, apparently we have a bag of Carolina Reapers up here. So if you guys... Um, is Capacin a drug? Do you want to end up on the toilet in two days? You mean four two days. It could be sooner than that. All right, so I'm ho a hopeless optimistic. You it's fine. Your taste bud life. These are damaged. Okay, thank you very much. We've actually got thank you. So I just, uh, I think probably the same person had one of those. Like, hey, anybody want it? Slingshot <laughs> chickens. Okay. What's this URL again? <laughs> Q.lo. Oh, oh, okay. Dang. I like spicy food. So like, that's not spicy. That's just mine too. We should be doctors. Get your PhD, and it'll be yeah, simple. Oh, we're actually doing mine. Okay. Uh, are we done? Like a text from it. Do we want to do this? Does anyone care? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, I wasn't sure if there was interest or not. We'll go ahead and do it. All right. Um, let me back up. Yeah, there we go. Blah, blah, blah. Citizen science. Bullshit, bullshit. Meteors, meteorites, cheap hardware, global networks. All right. So this is the first of the global networks I found when I was researching this. And keep in mind, I've only done a, a couple of weeks' worth of research on this because I just kind of sort of decided what I wanted to do a few weeks ago. Um, this network here, uh, they've got NASA sponsorship. If you go to the URL there, they've got the NASA contacts, and they, um, uh, they've got a suggested list of minimum hardware requirements and what it takes to participate. And I've uh, got the stuff on there. You, obviously, the more camera net, cameras in the network you have set up, the better results you're going to get. 
problem is, look down at the specs there, um, it's Microsoft Windows 7 software, um, it's, it's closed source, um, y the PC you need isn't you know, that particularly powerful or expensive, um, but the cameras they want used are these uh, Watek systems, and they just stopped making them. This information is several years old. The cameras retailed for about $500 a pop, and they can be even more expensive to find nowadays used. So um, I have a feeling NASA will update some of this information in the not too distant future. And um, let's see, there's the, the networks that are currently covered by this. The open circles are the official NASA ones. The closed circles are the um, amateurs and the semi-professionals who are set up using the, the SETI system. You can see a lot of the open, the open circles there are based uh, mainly out of Marshall Space Flight Center. And um, there's a big amateur network up in the Maryland and Virginia area, which I'm going to be moving up to. So those are all of potential interest to me. And the fact that the main point of contact on the NASA side for for this global network is at Marshall Space Flight Center and I know a bunch of people who work at Marshall even if the information is outdated I can find out relatively quickly who's in charge there and get some current updated information um, possibly before they put it online so um, these are the main groups who in, in small uh, in, in Marshall, Marshall Space Flight Center is in Huntsville Alabama okay. so it is not a bad drive from here at all that's where all the engineers are, basically. And if you are within driving distance, I strongly recommend going down there for an afternoon, taking the tour, see the rocket factory tour. It's freaking amazing. That's where the, the engineers are, and that's where they build a lot of test uh, equipment and test to destruction occasionally. And uh, it's a lot of fun, even if things blow up, because, you know, hey, even if, if things blow up horribly violently, we've got all of our safety procedures in place. No one gets hurt, and we can still learn a lot, and you get a good show. So is that, is that the one where they the laid down the, the, the fun, fully functional Saturn V? Yeah, they've got uh, a, a little um, side, uh, side quest here because I'm a big fan of the Apollo era hardware. There were actually three full-sized Saturn Vs scattered around the U.S. There's one at Kennedy um, Space Flight Center down in Florida, at Marshall and Huntsville, and Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, Texas. These aren't models or mock-ups. These were things that were supposed to fly. The last Apollo mission that, la that um, landed on the moon was Apollo 17. Apollo project was supposed to go to Apollo 20, and that was supposed to be just the first stage. And the reason it all got canceled was because Richard Nixon unexpectedly won the um, 68 election instead of Hubert Humphrey. Humphrey was a huge space fan, wanted to continue the project, wanted us to go on to Mars. Nixon famously said, I am not going to continue a successful Democrat program and helped defund it, and that money went into the Vietnam War. Yay. Yeah. Headed out. Headed out? Okay. Bye, Scott. Thank you for letting us. Uh, thank you for putting up with us for so many years, Scott. I appreciate it. So, yeah, those uh, three full-size Saturn V mock-ups aren't mock-ups. They were supposed to be Apollos 18, 19, and 20, and we even had um, Commander Richard Gordon here who went to the moon on Apollo 12 a few years back. Um, he was the guy who stayed in orbit on Apollo 12 while the other two guys went down. Apollo 18 was supposed to be his command mission when he walked on the lunar surface. Apollos 20 and 19 were canceled first. Apollo 18 was canceled six months out from his flight. The rocket was built and stacked in the large vehicle assembly unit. And as Commander Gordon or Captain Gordon said, yeah, and that's why I became an alcoholic for the next 10 years when they canceled my flight six months before we were supposed to launch. So still, if you ever get a chance, go out and see those rockets. They are absolutely fucking amazing. Nixon they uh, should have flown. didn't they want to flown. continue a Democratic uh, presidential uh, uh, campaign but he yet he continued the vietnam war which was uh, he campaigned on the vietnam war in 1972 even though um kissinger had told him that the war was unwinnable but he wanted to make sure that um he had the strongest possible position going into the 72 campaigns so even though knowing that we couldn't win it um he campaigned on a build up and winning the war and all that mattered to him was getting into office yeah. for that second term yeah. fuck LBJ, everybody who died uh, right LBJ, well, LBJ continue, or one of the one of the 
Uh, yeah. cre- cre- no. Oh, I'm not saying LBJ was innocent on this yeah. either. Yeah. But yeah. candidate or citizen Nixon, when he wasn't even yeah. in office, had a big hand in sabotaging the 1968 peace process. Absolutely. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. Well, the yeah. part of the <clears throat> another thing to recognize though is the fact that uh, we actually did win the Vietnam War. The uh, after the the uh, Tet Offensive, the Wait, is this hacking 201? <laughs> we always drift off topic, man. It's Can we get back on track? I don't mean to be a dick, but... Yeah. Oh, okay, we can't be political on the camera. Sorry about that. Never mind. We'll, we'll do that later when the camera's yeah, on. Yeah, let's, uh, let's get back let's to hacking uh, shit. We'll get back to the space stuff, but yeah, real quick, if you ever get a chance to uh, see at um, Johnson in Houston, Marshall in Huntsville, Alabama, or Kennedy Center down in Florida, those Saturn Vs are absolutely amazing. They should have flown, and they were built to fly, but... Yeah, whatever. The uh, other the other insane thing that they did was they destroyed all the plans, every single one of them, for the Saturn V vehicle, so no one could make a duplicate and make something that competed oh, in with the, the space oh, shuttle. Oh, so close, so close. Not quite correct. There is actually a full warehouse of Saturn V plans in... Uh, Camden, Georgia, I think. I'll have to go back and look it up. The problem is that this is 50-year-old technology. A lot of the manufacturing techniques no longer exist, and of course, a lot of the engineers who designed and worked on this stuff are dead. So, But the documents are still there in physical form, if, and if you want to scan them in at some point so we can see them, uh, well, you know, get some funding and a budget, and maybe in 50, 60 years, you'll finish that project. Yeah. So. But, but NASA actually did try and kill it, is one of the most insane things I've ever thought of. Maybe security issues once the um, what you call the Mashan assembly assemb- uh, assembly facility in Mississippi was shut down the project was essentially dead by 1968 even though we still have <laughs> flown hardware so all right back to this thing here um, uh, Marshall Space oh I'm sorry go ahead question sure why not distraction OCD. not a question ah! just a statement okay a small correction um, the first stage in Kennedy is not space hardware it's actually a vibration test engineering model that they put in the stack you're right because they actually did fly um one of those uh first stages to put skylab in orbit you were correct i am wrong thank you huh? u.s yeah it, it, uh, Skylab went up on a basically um, an Apollo uh, 5 base, and it had the, um, the 2B on it as well, or was it just the Apollo? Okay, yeah. It basically was sitting on top of an Apollo stack, I mean, uh, Saturn stack instead of the Apollo uh, module and lunar module, and that's how they put Skylab in orbit because it only had to go into low Earth orbit instead of being boosted to the moon. The, yeah, if I remember correctly, the Saturn V stack could put 140 tons into low Earth orbit and 35 into lunar injection orbit. And that's one of the exciting things about Starship, if they can actually get it working, is that they can put 300 tons into low Earth orbit in um, expendable mode. So you can do a lot of shit if you can put 300 tons into low Earth orbit. At that point, you're halfway to anywhere, as Dr. Buzz Aldrin famously said. It just takes a couple of nuclear weapons. I so wish we would bring back Project Orion. Oh, my God. To Mars by A-bomb. I mean, rockets and nukes, two of my favorite things in the world. Ah, my penis can only get so erect. <laughs> Nerva would probably, yeah, be the um, more reliable and better. But come on, man. Flying, flying by spitting A-bombs out the back of your rocket, blowing up, up and essentially riding the shock It's wave. literally the most American thing ever. That, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. How are we going to get some <laughs> Boy, All right, hacking 201. Go. <laughs> All right, so anyway, back to this project. The NASA part is coordinated, again, as I said, out of Marshall Space Flight Center and Ames Research Center, which is in California. Uh, there's also the Fireballs logo up there, which is part of Marshall Space Flight Center. It is... Um, uh, running out of there too, the difference between a meteor and a fireball is a fireball is a meteor or meteorite that's brighter than Venus when seen from the ground. So, and then you hear a, a meteor and a meteorite. Huh? Just, just to reiterate, the distinction between a meteor and a meteorite. Yeah. Meteor is one you uh, see flashing across the sky, or a fireball, and hopefully it's not you know, the kind of thing that wiped out the dinosaurs. A meteorite is a meteor that makes it to the ground, and maybe if you're lucky you can actually find something left there and pick it up and either collect it or sell it for a lot of money. They're quite valuable. All right. Um, let's see. The International Meteor Organization is sort of like the uh, NASA-sponsored one, except it's international and NASA's not involved. European Space Agency is pretty heavily involved in it. Um, very active over in Europe and Australia. And here, have some chickens. 
Have fun. Continue <laughs> making them fly. Oh, come on. <laughs> um, it seems to be more recent, uh, pardon me, more updated and more active, at least from what I can see online, than the um, brain fart here. Um, yeah, the cams.seti.org one. Nice. Um, this one seems to be more for professional and the semi-professional observers. There is a hell of a lot of technical detail on that site. If you want to get on their network and you want to um, do all sky monitoring, again, they're using the um, the NASA recommended very expensive and now kind of no longer manufactured cameras. So hopefully we'll see even more recent updates from them. Yeah, the Watek cameras and. Uh, a big minus for me is their software is DOS. You got to run the, their DOS software to do this stuff. So, like, why? Yeah. Yeah. They've got some other uh, cameras that are recommended, but the um, the NASA recommended ones, the uh, looking at my things here, yeah, the Watek ones um, are the, the top rated, but they've got a few others there, and they actually give comparisons on the different specifications, and they've got more information on the lenses too. So. Interesting information, but still not quite what I was looking for. Then I found the Global Meteor, Global Meteor Network, and they seem to have started around the end of 2017, and they seem to kind of embody the cheaper, faster, better, be disruptive and break things model, and I sort of like that. Um, instead of using an actual Windows-based PC or a Windows PC you're running DOS on, they're saying Raspberry Pi 4s. You can do 3s if you want, but 4s are going to be a lot better. And their software package is free and open source, and it is updated uh, a lot. The most recent update before the convention was August 24th. And um, you can use the Watek cameras, but they've got a whole bunch of information on there on basically do-it-yourself cameras. They had kit cameras for sale, currently sold out, but they've got a whole lot of information on there where you can basically... Um, put your own camera together if you're willing to 3D print some of the, the parts. The core is the Sony IMX, IMX291 CMOS. Um, you can add whatever lens and other pieces you want onto it, hook it up to the Raspberry Pi, and you should be able to get this um, uh, one camera set up. You're, if uh, you're doing this, your very first one done for under 200 bucks, as opposed to 750 800 $900 for... Um, um, the system is recommended by the other two groups, and if you're doing more than one camera, the cost per camera goes down the more cameras you add to it. So that's definitely the one I'm looking at. I'm going to order some pieces, parts after Dragon Con and start playing around with it. My goal is by next Dragon Con is um, to do a presentation on Space Track with the results of the research. This is the grant proposal I'm writing with the assistance of my professors right now. And um, even if I'm not around to see the project completed, I'd like to get a few dozen cameras set up around the Middle Tennessee area and have that continued through the colleges and the universities I've been working with. I'll get to you in just a second. Yes, sir. How does life you just you your study? It sucks. Yeah, yeah. Um, right now, that's pretty much all I got to say about it until I can actually get some gear deployed and get some feedback from people who are better, smarter, more informed on this stuff than I am. Um, all I know is it sucks, and the, the Starlink launches in particular are playing havoc with any kind of ground-based observation. What did you, anyone remember yeah, the, uh, the, the, the name of the scale of light pollution? There's a specific scale of light pollution, and there, it has a specific name. Elon Musk. <laughs> no. Scoville unit. unit. No. 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 Ah. I think that's more than a single Scoville unit. Yeah. Um, Bortle. Yeah. Uh, anyway, what is it? Bortle. Bortle with B. More information on the global media network <laughs> stuff here, basic specs. You know, got a blog, mailing list, and Wiki has got an insane <laughs> amount of tech details on it. The RMS software in particular, I was happy to see this. They seem like to that. take security yeah, seriously. Yeah, you know, unlike IoT, where the S is for security, they actually do um, have passwords, SSH keys, and everything is run through VCNs. Um, camera resolutions I've got there uh, of interest. I'm not sure that there's really that much more benefit to doing a 1080p than 720 when you're doing a full sky observation since you're basically looking for streaks that go across the sky. Maybe if you're real interested in faint stuff, but I'm more interested in the brighter stuff and the fireballs and what makes it to the ground. 
So um, this is what's got me really interested in Global Media Network. Um, this is a, the end results of a two-year study that were done in one of the Belgium chapters that said, hey, you know, these cheap cameras where we buy the $40 core and then 3D print everything else ourselves, we're getting better results from that expensive shit that's no longer being made than NASA recommends. So I uh, got a few articles here that give more information. The 2020 article is kind of what originally um, piqued my interest, but I didn't do a whole lot with it. Um, like I said, until just a few weeks ago when I was looking for a senior project and rapidly found more information on it. We'll have a copy of this stuff um, up on, hopefully on the EFF website. So you know, if you're trying frantically to write down some of these URLs or taking pictures of everything, we'll have it up there cleanly so you can just click on stuff and go straight to it. Uh, anybody wants before you leave the, um, the panel at the end of the night, come up to me and I'll give you my contact information. I'll email you a plain text copy in a couple of days. Let me retire from the, I mean, let me uh, recover from the uh, Dragon Con this year for a few days and then I'll, I'll email you a text copy of this with everything. And so, yeah, that's the project that I've decided I'm gonna work on and I've already contacted a bunch of folks and I've started getting feedback on it and hopefully I'll have some cool shit, not just for the space track, but I can bring in um, an actual, um, system with some cameras and stuff here for next Dragon Con and we can play with it. So, uh, thank you. One of the one of the things I learned when I went back to school was how to actually do like real research and write science papers. So I did put some work into this and I hope to get actually something good out of it and I want to, if anyone's interested, I'm more than happy to share anything I learned from it with it, as many people who want to hear about it as possible and um, I'm going to make everything, of course, free and open source. And um, yeah, thank you. I take this pretty seriously. Glad you're interested. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Johnny X is a really cool uh, project. Um, Raspberry Pis are really hard to come by. Uh, is there a reason that you're not using like an ESP32 or anything inside of the uh, microcontroller families to be able to make this like five dollars? Like I, yeah, I just found out um, within the last week that there's been uh, a real shortage of Raspberry Pi. You want to know where the Raspberry Pi fours are going? Micro Center. No, not not, not my, Micro Center. Micro Center is. Micro Center is being very good about that, um, trying to keep the scalpers from getting that stuff. They're, they sell you, I think, one per month on average, and they only do the bulk sales and discounts to like actual schools and places like that. Those goddamn fucking scooters that are crowding up all the sidewalks, they're Raspberry, four, uh, Raspberry Pi 4 based. So You're telling me there's a Raspberry Pi 4 based really one of those things? Yeah. 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 Well, I won't name names, but uh, someone else associated with the panel and I were talking uh, about this yesterday as we were walking around outside and tripping all over those and noticing how much sidewalk space they were taking up. Goddamn, sure would be a shame if a bunch of people just went out there with screwdrivers and stole all the fucking raspberry uh, 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 four, yeah, Pi 4s out of them, wouldn't it? So, so which is using the Raspberry Pis? Apparently yes. all of them. All of them? Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Don't say, don't say what real bit you need to do. Uh, I... I <laughs> so, the universal Dremel. Those things get on my nerves. Let me downtown. They, yeah. Yeah. Pies also got more okay, expensive so, because yeah, of the there, there was, there was a question too. there about why am I not using alternatives to ras uh, Raspberry Pi 4s. Well, that, I'm, I'm not sure what else is out there right now. Like I said, I'm just getting into doing this, and Raspberry Pis for, uh, Raspberry Pi 4s were the recommended. Excuse me. 3 uh, plus for life. life. Yeah, they were the recommended base before apparently there was a shortage of them. So uh, I'm quite open to any other alternative solutions, especially if they're cheaper and faster. The price is supposed to get a little less crazy. I don't know if a microcontroller could be like the image yeah, this is just an overview. There, there's uh, a lot more behind the scenes technical details there, and I will be. Oh, oh, so close. Almost got in there. Almost. You want to try that again? I got more. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, well, they toss it back out into the wild. Um, but yeah, again, get with me before you, you take off and go do something else, and I'll be happy to exchange personal information and talk with people. Hell, we can set up a mailing list or a Discord or whatever and talk yeah. about this further. So yeah, I'm very serious about having uh, hardware and um, uh, result, yeah, you know, program results to present at DragonCon next year.
So any other questions, comments, criticisms, mics open. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next group of folks. Oh, Dustin, should we go ahead and reveal Should we go ahead and reveal our, our real secret project? Not uh, yet. Not yet. We oh, have 16 okay. minutes, sir. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm... I, I, okay, okay. I'm done for now. Next person. Secret project. Dustin. Oh, well, D Dustin's off doing secret shit. We'll review when the camera comes off. So. Yeah, but the, it's locked. A room full of hackers in this time. He'd buy <laughs> just just go ahead and start talking to the mic someone will pay attention so what I have found is that I'd niche myself into cyber systems, cloud systems as a security engineer. Uh, what uh, advice or feedback do you have on how I can fully transition into a security engineer that works on cyber physical systems? Um, I am not the person to ask, so... Just say I feel like a cyber security person. I, I used to. Well, I, 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 am, I, I am a security engineer, but I am limited to the cloud. I can't get these cool contracts, you know, where I get to pin test shit and break into places. I used to do web, um, uh, web application security. So, so I used to do web applications and just be a web, just be a web programmer. And some of the certifications that you might want to look for are uh, OSCP, which is a Authentic Security Certified Professional. That's a great one that teaches you like uh, just a lot. And that is that the developers of Kali Linux, for instance, uh, also run that certification, Offensive Security. Um, well, I, I, I have those yeah. certifications, but I, I, I'm stuck in the... I, I'm stuck as a security engineer in the world of the digital. I want to be able yeah. to transition to, you know, physical perimeter access. I want to be able to transition to real-world things that I can touch and not just, you know, cloud container security. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, well, what, what do you mean by that, sir? Nuclear power, um, anything well, involving life safety. Healthcare. Yes, like, like transition, making that transition, because I am a security engineer, but I'm bored and sitting in front of my computer all day. Yeah. So I work, I work in the healthcare industry, and we are very, at least my door. company is very cloud averse. Um, we're slowly oh. moving. Yep. Yep. Yeah, as long as things like I did last week and found some stupid engineer that, despite our Despite our efforts to uh, geo-block anything except for our data center, went ahead and put in routes and firewall rules to allow access from his home. But he put in the entire uh, slash sixteen, so of his network of his uh, ISP. So yeah. <laughs> so one of, one of the things you can do if you're trying to get into an another area that you're if you're trying to pivot is. So th this gentleman said he had the certification already, uh, and then the guy on the right side of the room said that that field has a lot of contractors in it. Here's the thing about contractors. Some of them are really, really desperate because they literally need a warm body that possesses the certification and can sit in a seat. And if you meet those qualifications, you can stop them from losing an entire contract. So if you, if you find a recruiter at the right time, it's uh, it's it's surprisingly easy to land a job that you realistically don't have experience in as long as you have the cert because what happens is there could be it could be a hundred person contract if they only get 99 people in on it they could lose the whole giant contract and so they they just want somebody who can check the box and that's how you get your foot in the door it, exactly and so if, you, if you've got the certs and so you can check the box the recruiters may not care that you don't have the actual work experience as long as you meet what the stated requirements are because their job is to fill what the customer told them to do not necessarily what the customer actually needs if that makes sense 
So what it, are it the recommended circs? It really depends on what your field is. Okay. Like, uh, it, but ask the recruiter. Like, they, they, they will tell you, I need a guy with Sec Plus. I need a guy with GCFA. Uh, for so he's saying CISSP. So if it's a if it's any sort of a government contracting role, there is somebody remind me the name of this shit, please. There's a whole list uh, of like different tiers of certifications. Hmm? So. So, so for for government contracts, basically there there can be uh, certs that are equivalent to other certs, and they need somebody at this particular level. There's a whole list of certs that meet that level. So your recruiter will tell you, you know, I, I need someone certified at this, you know, level two or level one, uh, and so you can pick a cert off the list. Makes sense. Am I displaying? Can you guys see my screen on the screen or no? Okay. It's pretty small. Pacific. Yeah, it's got to look like way too big for you to be able to see it. Okay. That woo means it worked. <laughs> so I was playing with this earlier. <clears throat> so I've got a couple of devices up here. Wi-Fi pineapples. My 7 is not working for some bizarre reason. Um, who doesn't know what a Wi-Fi pineapple is? Okay. So it's essentially, and it, like so I'm running one of, one of my people whose phone's right connected to it. Um, what I did earlier was just put an open AP on it and see who connected to it. It was called free Wi-Fi. Um, probably what happened is someone had connected to it a, a, an access point called free Wi-Fi, be Wi-Fi before and it auto connected. Um, but what I can, what some other stuff I can do with it, I just ran a recon, which scans for every access point in the area um, and shows even starts to show me things like these are the MAC addresses of the actual access points uh, I'm not gonna do it because these are live networks but what I could do now is take these networks and populate them into what's called pine AP <laughs> But the idea behind a Wi-Fi pineapple is I'm going to find a, a valid network and I'm going to clone that network and at start advertising that same SSID on this device. Then I'm going to send deauth frames, which deauth frames don't require me to have any access to the existing wireless infrastructure. It is a base part of the Wi-Fi protocol. Why is there not authentication with that? Who? Why is there not authentication for deauth frames? Like, did they think nobody would just replay those? That's fixed in WPA3. It so is fixed in WPA3. Yeah, it is. But somehow it took them to WPA3 to think of that and not 2 or mm -hmm. 1 in the first but place. Why would anyone ever want to do something bad? But yeah. what I do, so what I would do is send those deauth packets. Force, that forces you to, every client on that access point, to disconnect. It's going to instantly reconnect, and I'm hoping that you're going to reconnect to mine instead of theirs. In bygone days, it would plus one the channel of the Wi-Fi network and then try to reconnect. So if you were running, you know, say, um, a secondary network with the same SSID on a channel just above the one that you uh, your client had previously connected to, uh, then uh, de-authenticate that client, then it'll connect to your AP, just for funsies. You know, so at that point, I'm, I can sniff the traffic. I can even just pass it back to that network, so you don't even know. Um, some of the cool stuff I can also do is I can create. Get the I chicken in the cup. Ten points and free pairs. I can clone the captive portal. So where you go, you know, Hilton Honors, put in your username and password. I can clone that portal and log what anybody puts into it. Now, granted, I may not have the SSL certificate. That technically works, but that only works once. So, <laughs> so you're not. Hacking 201, give me. <laughs> what flight were you it on? It used to be so much more fun when, other, when yeah. networks were not using TLS. 
Um, so I could, you know, it may not, I may not be able to clone that SSL certificate, but be honest with me, how many times a day do you click past SSL certificate warnings? I mean, it just, you know, especially on a corporate network where everybody uses cell sign certificates, you know, it's very common for people to just click, what is that? Just, yes, go ahead and connect me. Well, yeah, I mean, but still, developers turn things up all the time without good certificates on it. Um, and this is something similar. So this is an alpha, and it's basically, this is a, uh, it's a, a Wi-Fi adapter on steroids. Um, I've got an older one in there, but this is, these can run in what's called promiscuous mode, uh, which means they can... All the packets all the time. Yeah, all the packets all the time. Anything that's floating around in the air. Yeah. Um, it will capture and can dump it to a PC, and we can run something. We can run something. Yeah, do it, don't do it in a Starbucks. Um, don't do it if you do it in a Starbucks in 2008. It's not hard. Don't do it at DEF CON if they're giving away badges that are deauthors. Don't sit in a casino and just continually do it. Uh, they will escort you out. I'm sorry, what was that? Okay, so colleagues of mine at work, they're like, oh, yeah, anytime we go to, like, Black Hat or, like, Defcom, like, we literally just take a full sandbox computer, and then we always wipe it when we come back. Is that, like, a real practice, or are they exaggerating? <laughs> to an extent. I, I would just turn know. the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth off and yeah. leave your stuff on there. Like, take a burner phone, though. Don't yeah. leave your real cell phone. Okay. I take my real cell phone. I take my real phone, and I turn all the radios off. And, okay. I keep, and I keep it on me, right? Like, if you leave it on a table or something, oh, yeah. somebody's going to fuck with yeah, it. Never lose possession, possession of your device, period. Keep it, keep it on you and encrypt your discs. Like, what are they going to do? But take a burner phone, because it's fun to fuck with. Yeah. <laughs> How so, so, so sir? On, on the subject of deauth attacks, by the way, I thought it was pretty amusing, because we're, we're saying don't deauth things that you don't have permission to. You know what commercial product defaults uh, will send out deauth packets to everything else around it? Uh, as a setting that you can just click a checkbox and it does it. There's a Nessus. Uh, cer certain types of Cisco Meraki routers will do that. Uh, <laughs> like the, the wireless access point and, and router combo. Uh, they're designed for enterprise uh, settings and they will, <laughs> they will do that uh, Supposedly, it's a security feature, they say, to stop people from like drop uh, putting a Dropbox or whatever, but it is a, it is a source of annoyance for network admins uh, who neighbor companies that use these uh, devices yeah. because their, <laughs> their Wi-Fi gets knocked out by their neighbor's deauth packets, and it's just like a button you can click. Back in the day, there was this uh, thing called EtherCap, and EtherCap was, was fun because uh, you can kind of... Um, Make sure that any image that is sent over a, a non-TLS connected, uh, you know, like a web uh, connection will um, just reverse the image 180 degrees. And so all the images on the internet for anyone that you're doing this to will uh, upside down turn it. Get it. And um, I, I did this, I, I, uh, 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 actually I changed uh, the Google uh, image in 2008 for my friends to just me doing this. Um, not for Google, but for that specific network that they were connected to. Yeah, but they thought it was for Google. And they were like, Bill, you hacked Google? <laughs> like yeah, uh, uh, sure. I'll let them believe that. <laughs> I'm not gonna eat it. So all this, yeah, want. this company is called Hack Five. I'm not pimping them at all, but I love toys, and they've got a lot of really good toys. So this guy, like this guy right here, looks like a regular USB. What, what is that? This is a this is a rubber ducky. This is, no, this is uh, an old one. I've got a bash bunny, too, which is very Not to be similar. confused with the rubber chicken. Not to be confused with the rubber chicken. For those that don't know, explain what that Yeah, so what this is, it looks like a normal USB device, but I, when you pop it open, it's got an SD card that we can put payloads on. Um, it will show up as USB storage, but the cool thing that it does is it shows up as a USB keyboard. All computers trust keyboards. They also trust devices that say that they're that keyboards. say that they are keyboards. 
So this device will say that it's a keyboard, and then I can run, you put a little script on the SD card, plug it in, and that script is typed on the computer. So obviously, pretty much anything you can think of running Python scripts, they, they have a regular ducky script. This guy is similar to Bash Bunny, can run kickoff Python scripts, PowerShell scripts, Bash scripts, uh, you name it on this device. Like I'm sorry? Can it run like an RPA? I don't think so. It's mostly, it's, it's mostly scripts okay. is what it will run. Uh, but this has got internal storage. It you know can copy your loot to. Um, and this one also can imitate a an Ethernet controller and, and establish can, a little private network and copy files. You can back program and forth. program what it automatically types within you know w mm -hmm. within that thing too. Yeah. Nice. All right, we are pretty much officially done. Hey. hey, hey, hey. Hacking two hundred one. So right. can we turn it off. Everybody say bye to the camera. Bye. Bye, bye camera. Bye. Somebody bye, put a camera. Put a chicken in front of it. Bye, bitch. I'll try to hit it again. I also like stuff like this, little lantern.